Florence Littauer once told us, a ready person never has to get ready. And I thought there was such deep wisdom in that. And as I have developed this、um, ministry to visit churches and speak with people about the importance of knowing how to interact with people in their loss, in their pain, in their grief, in their suffering, it occurred to me that many churches are not ready. In fact, it wasn't only did it occur to me, that's what I experienced. So let me see if I can get my little clicker out here. We'll get ourselves going.、Um, I didn't ask my PA man, do I point it your direction or that direction? It doesn't matter? Oh, look at that. Okay, we're working. So at one time in my life, I was 28. <laughs> And when I was that age, we attended the small church in Penn Valley, California at that time. And this beautiful, precious little boy. Dawson Tesla Nicola was with us along with his sister Joanna. And yes, Dawson Tesla Nicola was named after his father, the middle name, Stephen Tesla Nicola, who was named after his grandfather, Tesla Nicola, who was named after the inventor, Nicola Tesla. So, some people find that a curiosity and kind of interesting. But when I was 28, I was. And Steve was, we were together anticipating the death of our son. His leukemia had relapsed, and the doctors informed us that whether we treated with aggressive chemotherapy or whether we did not treat, the end would be the same, the result would be the same. So, being people who want to at least be somewhat informed about what is ahead of us, we've never ever walked that path of being with someone to their death. We read books and pamphlets, and doctors and nurses advised us, and we had some preparation about what to anticipate or experience at the bedside of our dying child. What we had no preparation for. Was what it felt like to fall into the chasm of grief. Our church congregation also was unprepared to travel with us in that space. So when I was 28 and we came to church a few weeks after Dawson died and I was walking down the, the, the hallway and.、Um, A church member was walking my way and looking down at the time, and as she looked up and saw that it was me, I could see it on her face. The sudden sense of panic, and she turned the other way and walked out the hall. I knew intellectually that she didn't have the skills. That she wished and wanted to have, to walk towards me, to embrace me. Now, to be honest, not everyone in our church had that same limited capacity, for there is a wonderful woman who just wrapped her, her arms around Steve and hugged and cried with him. And so today, it is part of the work that God has called me to do is to help raise the awareness. Because we are called to be comforters. And we've not had the discussion to learn to discover how to do that work, have we? So before we get involved in that, I want to share a little bit about the pain and the struggle, the, the theological questions that we ask, that we, that we wrestle with when these kinds of experiences occur in our life. And I want to start out with four questions. And the first of the four questions is. How are we grounded when tossed about in the storms of life? What holds us through that storm? What keeps us from going adrift to sea and never returning? Scripture tells us in Ephesians 3 17, then Christ. Will make his home in your hearts 
as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Now the question is asked, how in the world do people who don't trust in God get through times like this? And we see some of the ways that that happens. Self-medication through drugs and alcohol. Overwork. Finding anything that they can find that will keep them from feeling the feelings and still be able to barely keep their nose above water. But we sit in this house of God this morning, and while I cannot assume that every one of us has a vibrant, alive relationship with Jesus, let's say that that's his plan for every one of us. And if we say yes to that plan, we can have some assurances through the storms of our life that another person who doesn't know Jesus won't have. And so there was one assurance that I had after Dawson died, while all chaos took place in my mind, in my heart, in our lives, there was one thing that I knew for certain. And I'll tell you what that is in a minute. What's the picture that you see on the screen? Does anybody know? I know we're way inland, and coastal strolling probably isn't your Sabbath afternoon activity. But this is a scene of something that you might find on the beach. And you can identify two rocks, yes? You identify the root system holding onto the rocks. And on the top of that root system would be a long strand of seaweed. This root system on that rock is called a holdfast. And have you ever wondered how in the world the seaweed in the ocean, who we know is as tall as this church ceiling is, how does that seaweed, those kelp forests, stay in place? They stay in place because they are rooted to the rock. And the rock has grown into that root system, and that root system has grown into it, and it is called a hold fast. Now, seaweed can be torn apart maybe somewhere up in their branches, but rarely, ever, does the root and the rock ever part? Now, this rock came up from the bottom of the sea, and there it goes. But when the storms in the ocean take place, and this kelp forest, the seaweed is rooted to this rock, whatever the current may toss it, and it may flow all the way this way, and flow all the way that way, it is still rooted. What was the one thing I knew? The one thing... I knew was Jesus loved me. I had taught it to my babies. You know the song, sing it with me. Jesus loves me, this I guess. Oh, did I miss it? Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. No lie has ever come from the Word of God. I did not know so much at that moment about the deep theological questions and the fear and the pain and what grief was going to drag us through, but one thing I did know, I was loved. That was my grounded root. So this was what Paul tells us. He says in Romans 8, I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. So I'm going to have us practice really absorbing, taking in this conviction this morning and demonstrating this conviction by the tone of our voice when we together will read this scripture out loud. So let's give it a try. And when we get to the word convinced, just the phonetics of that word gives us the capacity to really pronounce it as if it is an un 
questionable reality in my life. Let's say it with that kind of conviction and assurance as we read it together. I am... Okay, really close group. You guys are right on. Let's try it one more time and see if we can truly say that word as if our life depends on it. One more time, and then we'll continue reading. I am convinced that nothing, read with me, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither tears, fears for today nor worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, when the storms of life hit us, I hope and pray that you find yourself grounded in the rock of love. A beautiful passage from um, Mrs. White in Thoughts um, from the Mount of Blessings reads like this. Live in contact with the living Christ, and he will hold you firmly by a hand that will what? Never let go. Know and believe the love that God has to us, and you are secure that love is a fortress impregnable to all the delusions and the assaults of Satan. Amen. Question number two. Where does peace come? Where does it come from in the midst of our chaos? You know, the disciples who followed Jesus they had no idea how drastically their life was going to change in one short day. One night they're feasting in the, in the Passover in the upper room, dreaming about the kingdom that was going to come and which place and role they were going to play in. But Jesus tried to warn them, and these were the words he said from John 16, verse 33. He said, I have told you these things, all these things that we've talked about, not just this night, but all my life with you. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He's preparing them. He's getting them ready for, he says, in the world you will have trouble and suffering, but take courage, I have conquered the world. So my friends, why is it we're so, so surprised when we have troubles and suffering? Did Jesus just not tell us? Be prepared. You live on planet Earth. It's my address as well. And troubles and suffering will be a part of our experience. But he also told them something amazing that night. He said, do not... Let your hearts be troubled. Now, isn't that a difference? We can have trouble all around us in the world, all the things that might be happening, but he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in me. You believe in God. Believe also in me, John 14, 1. And then he told them, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Now, the story I want to share with you is absolutely nothing to do with Steve and myself, but it illustrates the faithfulness of this gift. The night that our son took a very definite turn for the worse, we called our pediatrician and asked her to please come and be with us. And she was, and we were so thankful that she was. Neither she nor we knew that Dawson would die that morning. 
but as we sat those dark morning hours by his bedside, and we heard the last breath leave his body. I had imagined in my mind that God some way, somehow would would wrap his arms around us and we would feel this physical sense of, of a hug from God. I imagined that maybe there would be a warm glow through that just before sunrise darkness that's the darkest of all. But there was no warm glow through the window or anywhere else in the room, and it was silent. We wept, and we cried, and we held our little guy. Dr. Sarah was by our side later in the morning when our pastor came by, and she was getting ready to leave. She said, I have never been with parents who were as peaceful as Steve and Karen. I didn't hear that story for several weeks. And so I struggled and I wrestled and I said, God, where were you when we needed you in that darkness? Why was it so dark and so quiet and so lonely? And then I heard the rest of that story. He was evident in the peace of mind and heart that he gave us. That's not something we can conjure up on our own, is it? So you see, that is to God's glory, to God's glory. I am leaving you with a gift, the gift of peace of mind. Our next question is, how do we keep faith instead of, and I should have said, instead of losing our faith when encountering deep suffering? Because a crisis of faith usually means that we're wrestling and struggling. And when we're wrestling and struggling with God, we're both going to win, aren't we? At least those have been the stories that I've seen. So we take a look of how does faith grow? Faith grows with resistance training, just like muscles grow. What's this guy doing? Is he getting stronger or weaker? And how is that strength being developed? By sitting in an easy chair? Or by resistance training, pushing against the muscle, the muscle pushing against that weight? Oh, my goodness. By faith, we push back. We push back at what Satan would put into our lives to destroy us. And our faith muscle is strengthened. You know that, brothers and sisters. The times where it's been crisis in your life, your faith muscle is strengthened. Not when it's at ease, not at a time at ease. Jesus' early disciples knew how to, how their faith had been strengthened, and they wrote about it. And they wrote about it in ways that we rarely talk about it with each other. You know, when we go through a trial and a trouble, we don't say, oh, wow, we should really be rejoicing now, shouldn't we? But our model in Scripture tells us that. Consider it, James tells us, consider it sheer, a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith is forced into the open and shows its true color. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Peter says it this way, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief of all kinds. Let me clarify. Do we rejoice that my son died? No. Do you rejoice that you got in a car accident? No. Do you rejoice that you've gone through a nasty, horrible divorce? No. What are we rejoicing in? That God has never left us. He's given us this peace, and our faith in him is being strengthened day by day because, you see, it is of more value in the eternal kingdom of heaven than a church full of gold bars. Are we exchanging in the heavenly currency? Are we settled? for a piece of gold. Next question. Is there the possibility that anything good can come from this pain? 
Isaiah 61, and the scripture is read so nicely by our young gentleman this morning. It says, the last part of it, we're going to read it in its backwards makeup. It's talking about what's happening when we experience sorrow and grief. And as we experience the comfort of God, he says, I want to provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. Now, do you know how people grieved and mourned in ancient Bible times? Did they get all dressed up fancy? What did they wear? Sackcloth. Scratchy, uncomfortable, irritating garment that accentuates the irritation and the uncomfortableness of the pain of the broken heart. And then they would go to their fire pit and they would take ashes from their their cooled fire pit and pour it over their head and push it into their clothes and they would sit and very vocally mourn and weep and wail. Their culture permitted them to express the agony of their broken heart. Our culture doesn't. And in that culture, in that picture, in that scene, God promises in Isaiah, I have a way of exchanging those ashes that's all smashed in your head for a crown of beauty. I have the ability to restore the oil of joy in the place of your deep mourning. I will indeed take your garment of heaviness, your spirit of despair, and clothe you instead with a garment of praise. Are these my words? Did we just make this up because we want to believe this? No, this is the message through the prophet Isaiah of how fully God intends to restore the brokenhearted. Isn't it beautiful hope? It is magnificent hope, my friends. And that's why we grieve, but we do not grieve as the world grieves. We grieve with hope. And so it was like this for me. I don't know if it's ever felt like this for you, but after Dawson died, it was as if the devil had put this huge pile of garbage in our yard, in our home. There was no way of skirting around it. The pain was everywhere. The questions, the agony, it was just garbage and trash. But I came to discover that that's exactly the stuff God loves to work with. He is the divine repurposer. Doesn't he do a magnificent job in our lives? Can't we see that? Don't we long to just say, okay, you do your work to take my ashes and give me your crown. Take my despair, give me your joy. It's the faithful work of Jesus who will do that. And so then we say, what is this mission of comforting? Will we step into the pain of people around us and know how to bring them the comfort? Well, brothers and sisters, we can't export something we don't have. So we must first embrace the comfort God has for us so that we can give it to others. At the graveside, this can be our message of hope. Because Jesus promised, his mission is, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. He stood in front of his fellow believers in Nazareth and said, the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. My brothers and sisters, if this was the mission, and Jesus read from this very verse in Isaiah, we see it in Luke chapter 4, he stood and read this. If this was the mission of Jesus, and we say, I am a Jesus follower, 
Is this our mission too? And if we've never considered that it could be our mission and we say, I have no idea how to do this work, that's why I've come this afternoon to spend a wonderful workshop opportunity with us to explore and to share together how we can live this mission out. Because you see, I have a dream. I have a dream. What would happen if Adventist churches around the world were filled with the mighty oaks, these restored lives planted as God wants to plant us, people who have let God heal our brokenness, what would happen if we were living now to bless and comfort others until they too became a mighty oak? Just what could happen?